do it. You scrawled on this video to do it. It's your boy, Daddy Scobar Dreamer. All right, y'all, we back with another big body banger. You feel me? Listen, today we are going to be reacting to something that is very interesting. I never thought I'd see a video like this. It really just popped up, and I'm like, yo, this looks mad interesting. The thumbnail was crazy. The title was crazy. It's basically a video about people that confess to doing, like, these horrible, horrible, sick, gruesome, crazy murders. You know what I'm saying? But they never got caught for it. But they like on their deathbed or they about to die. And I guess they want to get that off their chest. You know what I'm saying? Before they died. You know what I'm saying? Get some type of repentance or some type of whatever. Get it off their chest. Some clear mindedness before they die. You know what I'm saying? So basically these people confess to those crazy wild murders right before they died. So uh, honestly, I'm very excited to watch this video. If you're excited too, smash the like button. Subscribe if you're not subscribed already. And hit the post notification bell so you can be notified whenever I drop these bangers. You know what I'm saying? Make sure you cop yourself a Jew rag. You can buy two and get the therm free, or you can bundle up to save $750. We got the best directs in the game to cover your ugly hairline. You know what I'm saying? I'm trying to help you when you help me help you. You know what I'm saying? So it's a win win situation here. You know what I'm saying? But without further ado, man, let's hop right into this. I got my popcorn right here. We from the vibe out. Let's go. In what is probably the vast majority of cases involving murders, the guilty person is captured and brought to justice. This, of course, does not bring back the life that they stole, but it also allows the family of the victim to have a sense of closure. But what about those that actually manage to get away with murder? The following stories tell the tale of three incredibly evil people who got away with murder and never admitted to what they did until they were about to die. One victim was just a child for no reason, and another had been a long abuser before becoming a victim themselves. Still, others were simply for being in the wrong place at the wrong time. It was the evening of August 5th, 1989, and 14-year-old Gina Brooks of Fredericktown, Missouri, was enjoying the summer day by watching her brother's baseball game. She was a beautiful, blonde-haired, green-eyed teenager with her whole life ahead of her. After the game ended, she would return home for a little while before later deciding she was going to visit her boyfriend. He only lived six blocks away. That her boyfriend killed her. Her boyfriend killed her, randomly. He was just bored one day. He took a paper knife. I mean, not a paper knife. He took a a, a, yeah, a a butter knife and just went shank. You know what I'm saying? I already know what goes on. Evening, Gina had already told her mother, Sydney, goodnight, and Cindy had gone to bed. She told her brother she was going out before she left on her bike at around 10 p.m. that night. Many hours passed by, and eventually it was 2 a.m. Cindy happened to wake up in the night and decided to go check Gina's room, only to find it empty. It was then that she realized Gina still hadn't come home. Her mother was understandably frantic and called the police to report her daughter missing. Police began combing through the town searching for any signs of her. Eventually, they found her bicycle, which was abandoned on the side of the road, about five blocks from her house. But, but she, she was, was nowhere, nowhere around. around. Police also began questioning local neighbors to try to determine where Gina was last seen. They eventually find out that Gina was last seen nearby a local church. She had been seen standing near her bicycle when three men in a blue station wagon pulled up alongside her. They had, they been, had been following, following her. her. When they got out of the car to try to talk to her, she must have realized she was in danger because she hopped off her bike and took off while it wasn't clear to why, those who why would she hop off the bike the bike faster than you running shorty come on now witness this exactly what happened some people including gina's boyfriend heard screams and watched as the station wagon took off at a high pace towards the highway the whole town came out to search day and night for missing gina and her family were desperate to bring her back home they hung up posters searched local caves and woods but sadly were never able to find even a trace of the young girl who was set to start eighth grade not long after she disappeared oh, the she entire was town which was that's crazy she was real eighth grade is like 13 or something no eighth grade is like 10? What? What? Alexa. Alexa, how old are you in eighth grade? Eighth graders are between 13 and 14 years old. Oh, never mind. 13 or 14. That's still mad young, though. I ain't gonna lie to you. 
It was very small with only around 4,000 residents was terrified and traumatized by this great loss. Year after year passed and it appeared that this was going to be a cold case and that Gina's loved ones would never actually know what happened to her. But was this, was this really, really the end, end of the end story? story? Everything completely changed in September of 1996. There was a patient at St. Louis, Missouri Hospital who was in the process of dying. He had not only had cancer but was suffering from complications from AIDS. Dang. He knew that his days were numbered. This patient was a man named Brian Squires. In his very final days, he admitted to some of the nurses that he had information about not only one, but three brutal unsolved murders. He was behind the slaying of nine-year-old Angie Houseman. What the heck is wrong with this weirdo? Nine years old, bro? Come on now. This, this man pissed me off. He didn't get caught the whole time? who disappeared in November of 1993. Angie was from St. Anne, a suburb of St. Louis. With the help of another man, Bryant kidnapped her right after she got off the school bus. Her brutally beaten body was found tied to a tree just nine days after she was missing. She had been horrifically and left for dead. She eventually died of sun exposure, among other wounds. Bryant did not reveal who his accomplice was for this Man, crime. if you go snitch, Bryant, snitch on everybody. Snitch on the, the dude too. He deserves to rot in under the freaking jail cell. He deserves that. Snitch on him, Bryant. Bryant did reveal that a man named Nathan Williams had been behind the other murders though. He said in 1975, Williams, who was only 14 at the time, had killed a 23 year old woman named Laura Dinwiddie. Laura was a good person who worked as a volunteer with inner city children and taught them sign language. Her naked dead body was found in her apartment. She had not only been but but it Universal just Technical up, Institute is right in your this backyard. Just me and up, less than a year, you can Cuz if you go feel all heroic when you about to die and all that, don't hide people. Air it all out, bro. Air all of it out. You know what I'm saying? Bro was brutally Finally, Bryant revealed what actually happened to Gina that tragic night that would change her loved ones' lives forever. On the night of Gina's disappearance, he had been one of the three men in the station wagon that confronted the team. In fact, he had been behind the wheel. He claimed that the other two men with him were Nathan Williams and Timothy Bellow. While working together, the men kidnapped Gina, her throat, and then disposed of her body. Not long after making these what's horrific the confessions, Bryant- But what's the point of killing these girls? Like, what is the point of killing these shorties? Like, what's the point? No, I don't freaking, what are you getting out of this? You know what I'm saying? Oh my days, bro. Would die. He would never have to pay for the horrible crimes that he committed. But what about Nathan and Timothy, who were still alive? Both of these men were arrested in 1999 in connection to Gina's murder. Timothy was hardly a first time offender and had been in trouble with the law many times. Yeah, he looked in the like past, he could Most commonly in connection with taking advantage of women. When questioned by police, Timothy didn't deny being connected to Gina's murder. He even described the supposed location of her body, which was, which a, was freezer a freezer on, on his, his father's, father's vast. vast 96 acre, acre property. property. But while this area was searched thoroughly, police were never able to find Gina's remains. Tragically, Timothy's charges in connection to Gina's death would ultimately be dropped. In Tragically, Tim Ugly. Ugly. Timothy's charges in connection to Gina's death would ultimately be dropped in what? 1999, and he would later be charged with lying to the FBI. The sentence he ended up receiving was only a measly 30 months behind. Why did he let that ugly rat get get out? Why did he drop the charges on him? Man, this this don't make no freaking sense. In bars, which is about two and a half years. As if this wasn't already unfortunate enough, the charges against Nathan Williams in connection to Gina's case were also dropped. Law enforcement simply didn't believe that Bryant's deathbed confessions were the whole truth and that Nathan could have been responsible for two I don't know if it's the whole truth or not, but I know the mug pictures that y'all just showed me look like people that would do that foolishness, so keep them back there. You know what I'm saying? They look like people that do that. Keep them in the- they, 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 they look the part. In fact, they even claimed that because Bryant had confessed to his nurses and not the police, his confessions were no longer valid. 
Additionally, the nurses hadn't come to the police to tell them about the confessions initially because they did not believe Brian was actually of stable mind and telling the truth. However, Nathan would still have to pay for the other crimes he had been connected with, including having taken physical advantage of a little girl just a month after Gina's disappearance. He was also considered to be the person behind the disappearance of a 12-year-old girl named Tammy Sertum. Tammy of St. Charles, Missouri, disappeared during the beginning of August of 1975. Because Tammy was always running away from home, her family didn't report her as missing right away. But after she did not return home for a long period of time, her parents finally realized she had been the victim of foul play and notified the authorities. Nathan would later admit to not only kidnapping and taking advantage of young Tammy's body, but also to her to death and burying her body. Her remains were never discovered. Despite the evidence against him, Nathan has shockingly never actually been convicted of any murder. He did, however, get a sentence to a minimum of 30 years in prison in connection to his other charges. He is currently in prison at Jefferson County Correctional Center in Missouri. That just pissed me off, bro. Geraldine Kelly, who went by Jerry, was quite simply not the average woman you would come across in the early 1990s. She was quite small and dark haired, but she was also covered in tattoos, kept attack dogs as pets, and would even sometimes be spotted wearing an enormous boa constrictor around her neck. She was clearly not the type of person to be messed with, but what from her history would make her this way? Geraldine met her future husband, John Kelly, when they were both children. They went on to get married and later had two children, a daughter and a son. While things in their marriage may have started out okay, they took a turn for the worse in 1981 during a wedding one fateful evening. John had been drinking too much and ended up getting into a fight with some of the other wedding guests. While it's not clear exactly how it happened, the fight resulted in the death of his brother-in-law. John was terrified that he could be charged with murder, so he decided to pack up his family and move across the country. They settled in California where he would land a job working at a motel. But during this time, he was still drinking heavily and he and Geraldine would fight all the time, eventually causing their two children to move away and distance themselves from them. John was allegedly very abusive towards Geraldine for many years, causing her to become cold-hearted towards him. Eventually, the abuse became too much for her to bear and she decided to take revenge upon her husband. She shot him dead and then placed his body in a freezer where it remained for more than six years. Of course, Listen, no one. I'm not saying killing somebody is good or is ever justifiable or nothing like that, but she been getting abused her whole life. You know what I'm saying? At some point, people snap. Now, that snapping could have been her leaving or it could have been making him leave this planet. Now, I guess she went for the planet one. I'm not saying it's good that she did that, but I'm, I can understand it. You know what I'm saying? Because if you're getting abused your whole freaking life, it's just like a, it's, it's, there's a point where it's just like, ah, you know what I'm saying? I got to do something. And she chose that option, which I don't know if that's the better option. I, actually, I don't think it's the better option. I think the better option would be to leave. You know what I'm saying? But can't change nothing now. The fact she stuffed him inside the freezer and nobody found him for six months, six years. People need to start looking at people's freezers because that's the second time somebody brought up freezers in this video. You know what I'm saying? The first people, they had the freezer on the 96 acres of land. This person got the freezer inside their freaking basement. There needs to be searches of freezers these days because people is getting away with murders with just putting them in the freezer. Including law enforcement or Jerry's own family was at all aware of what she had done to John for many years. She told her children that their dad had simply died in a car and they had no reason to doubt this story. After all, why would she lie to them? It wasn't until around six years later that Jerry, now dying from breast cancer, would decide to come clean about what she had done. She told her daughter about the details of her husband's murder and her daughter would soon after notify the proper authorities. Police went to go check- Wait, wait. So she told her daughter that she killed her dad when her, her mom was about to die. So her, her daughter calls the cops on her mama that's about to die because she killed her daddy that was abusing her mama that's about to die. What's the point of calling the cops? She's about to die. Like she's literally on the verge of like it's like one more step and she's dead. What's the point of calling the cops? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? 
the freezer, Jerry had described, and sure enough, they discovered the remains of her former husband. While he was found quite severely decomposed, his body was soon identified due to his very specific tattoos. By this point, Jerry had already passed, and it was already too late for her to serve justice for her husband's murder. I'm saying it. That's what I'm saying. It was pointless for her to do that. Because, like, she died already. Who? What, what's the point of making... What's the point of any of that? Like, it, it, it's just pointless. Nobody will go to jail for it. It's just going to be, like, a thing that happened. And then... I don't know. I don't see the point of it. Y'all let me in the comments. Maybe I'm missing something. It was the year 1975, and 20-year-old Michael Mansfield was a student studying at Lincoln College. He was a hardworking student, but was unfortunately in a little bit of trouble with the law. He had been caught in the fall carrying stolen goods. The stolen items were record albums that he had been caught trying to dispose of in his dormitory. The district attorney decided to have mercy on him and cut him a deal. He said that he would drop all charges against him if he only turned in the person who sold him the goods. Michael agreed and would ultimately turn in 21-year-old Russell Smirk. That's not 20, which ain't no 21. He knew would earn him his own f in 21-year-old that, that man like 93. I don't know. I don't know what 21 you see, but this is 93. Maybe that's a new Smaker, picture. I don't know. Which he knew would earn him his own freedom when he testified against him. That Christmas, Michael decided to return home to Rolling Meadow, Illinois. He spent the holiday with his parents and everything started out normal. But on the evening of New Year's Eve, he would leave home only to never be seen again. He was gone without a trace and police had nothing to go off of. As time went on, it would eventually become a cold case. The following year, there would be another strange occurrence, but this time it was back in the city of Lincoln, Illinois, where Michael had been attending school. It was the morning of June 2nd and 51-year-old Lincoln resident, Ruth Martin, hadn't arrived at work and hadn't called to tell anybody she wouldn't be coming in. This was very unlike her. Her coworkers were afraid for her well-being, so they ended up calling her husband, Richard. Richard was already at work, but he quickly rushed home to check on his wife. It was there, in their own garage, that he discovered not only a bullet, but a blood stain. He searched the home from top to bottom, but there was no sign of his wife. Just like in the case of Michael, there were no signs pointing towards any particular suspect, and police had little to go off of. They did end up finding Ruth's car abandoned in a nearby city with additional blood in the trunk. Not long after, yet another tragedy would strike the city of Lincoln, which was already reeling from all the recent crime. It was October 9th, just a few months since Ruth's disappearance, and police received a 911 call. Gunshots had been heard ringing out in what was usually a quiet, peaceful neighborhood. They were called to the home of Jay and Robin Fry, who were both just 25 years old. They had both been down and at the time- Who's Robin catching all these bodies, bro? Who's catching, this is like, this is like six people that he done caught. Who is this man that's catching all these bodies? had sadly been pregnant with the couple's first child. Dang, Police so who now had tons of pressure to figure out who had committed these crimes were trying to find a possible motive and a possible connection between Ruth Martin's murder and that of the Fries. All of these individuals were well-liked and didn't have any known enemies, but eventually they would come to realize that both Jay Fry and Ruth Martin had an unusual connection that you certainly, certainly won't, won't be, expecting. be expecting. Both Jay and Ruth were expected to testify against Russell Smirkar. It all started with a petty incident at a grocery store where Jay worked. Jay had caught Russell stealing and ended up chasing him through the store and into the parking lot. In an effort to get rid of any evidence, Russell would end up throwing the stolen items into Ruth Martin's car. It was a package of steaks that cost no more than $4. Both Jay and Ruth were expected to testify against Russell for the incident, but they never got the chance to because he would take their lives, along with the life of Robin, who was simply in the wrong place at the wrong time. But what happened to Michael Mansfield, who was still missing? Police would eventually discover that Michael had also been expected to testify against Russell, but for a very different reason. He had disappeared before he ever got the chance. They now had a very clear suspect for all three of these crimes. Russell was soon after arrested and later convicted in connection to the murders. He was sentenced to two life sentences in prison. Throughout the years, investigators would try many times to get him to open up about how exactly these slangs occurred, but he refused. It wasn't until he was dying at 56 years 
old in 2011, that from his deathbed, he finally confessed to the murders. While he couldn't or wouldn't answer where Michael Mansfield's body was, he did say Ruth Martin's body was buried under a highway that was under construction. Sadly, police were never able to find her body or Michael's remains. Russell would die soon after his confessions. That don't make no freaking sense. See, I'm not understanding why he was killing all the people. He said they were supposed to testify against him from stealing some $4 meat from Costco. Sir, you was finna get a pat on the hand and sent out your way with a $50 fine and you decided to off two people. What? I'm not, I'm, that last one, that last dude, I'm, I'm a little confused about. I'm confused why he did all that extraness and killing all these people. And I'm confused why he ended up killing the other boy. Because the boy snitched on him. First of all, the boy snitched on him for being his supplier for the shoplifting, the stolen items. So he snitched on him. But he, then he ended up killing him because he snitched on him. I'm, I'm not understanding that. And then he... Honestly, probably the wildest one out of all these videos is probably that first one. Because that, that, that was just like... Them three dudes, them freaking disgusting three dudes, bro. I'm just mad that they, the other two guys didn't get jail sentences. They said that they both dropped the charges on them. Like, what? Uh, that didn't make me free. If, look at them. They look like pet, pet, per, They look like people that do the craziness. They look like them type of people. If we're being realistic here, they literally look like those type of people. And y'all just sent them home. You know they look like them people. You know what a pervert looks like. You know what a pedophile looks like. You know what a serial killer looks like. I know what all them people look like. I can tell you right now. I can tell you right now. Man, that's the end of the video, bro. What are you going to confess to on your deathbed? Let's say you knew you was about to die. What What are you going to confess to? If you were the type of person that had done something like this, would you confess on your deathbed? Be honest. Be realistic. Do you think you could... You would say that on your deathbed because maybe, maybe, what if you just miraculously got healed and you was going to live another 30 years, but now you confessed and you can't take it back? That would suck. Like, you think you about to die, but it was just a pranky prank. You back alive now, baby. You finna serve this 40 year sentence in jail. You know what I'm saying? Y'all let me know what y'all think in the comments down below. This is crazy, though. That's for about it, though. I'm going to see y'all. ALC3, so fly, hop out the butterfly. Wings to the sky, no, I'm never borderline. They choose I, cause I'm way above you. The waves make the haters love you when the ladies come through.